Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for our program, Tax Trends in M&A Transactions. My name is Larry Parker and I'm a partner in the M&A team at Williams Mullen and I'm joined by my colleague, Anna Dara Wendo. Anna is a partner in our tax section and someone I routinely go to to ask the stickiest tax, tax questions. Today's program will cover tax trends in M&A, um, including how current conditions are impacting deals and what trends we anticipate seeing moving forward. You may submit questions using the Q&A feature uh, on, on the button on the lower left, or lower right side of your screen rather. Uh, we will turn to questions at the end of the presentation. If you have, or are having any audio or technical problems, please use that same Q&A button. If you're, uh, <clears throat> and hopefully our uh, technical folks will be able to reach out to you using that Q&A feature. Um, finally, no need to write down everything as you see the deck. We'll share the deck following the presentation later today. Okay, let's get started. Um, Anna, how are you seeing changes in the, the way we address workforce mobility, primarily withholding for employees um, when we deal with uh, workforce that's working in multiple locations? Yeah, and... You know, you can see from this list, these are all issues that we've been seeing in the last couple of months on the sell side that the buyers have been bringing up. And, you know, once um, COVID started and everybody, you know, was working from home, and sometimes that home was Colorado or California, it started raising the issues of how were employers going to keep track of um, all of their employees and do proper withholding. Um, and even if we're not seeing it in that context, buyers are very aware of these issues. And it seems like even if they're not sort of COVID related movements, um, we're seeing a lot of buyers focus on, have you been doing um, the proper withholding in the proper states? And so, you know, one of the things that we may suggest to buyers is, or sorry, to sellers, is if they have these employees that have remote possibilities, we've even gone to the extent of, you know, entering into telecommuting agreements um, with the employee. So that's between the company and the employees that will say the employee is going to be in state X from period, you know, A through B. And so that gives the company a little bit more predictability and, you know, will even include an indemnification provision. Um, so that if they move, that they will indemnify the company for taxes, penalties, interests that, that could arise, because it, we're, it, it's definitely something that we're seeing on in our transactions, um, where buyers are, you know, I think we're all expecting states to really start digging into this. Um, so nobody wants to take that, that liability on. Um, we're seeing in some of our, in some of our deals, um, cleanup that needs to be done. Um, particularly in states where, you know, it may be one thing where maybe you have been doing employee withholding taxes in that state, and maybe it just isn't the right amount and the, the right allocation, but at least you did some withholding and filed some returns, so the statute of limitations started. Um, but then that risk increases if it's a state that you've never had any employees in before, and you've never had any reason to file, and so you never did file, and so your statute of limitations hasn't started. Um, so, you know, that's definitely something we've, we've seen some cleanup around. And so we're just trying to get ahead of it with some of our companies to see if we can at least increase the, the predictability and, um, just try to do the compliance as, you know, as best we can. Okay. Um, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of, a lot of that recently myself. So let's pivot to another question here, Anna. Um, just explain, explain the trend that we are seeing in working capital and debt true up mechanisms that uh, tend to cover broader sections of the uh, balance sheet, including broader uh, expansive definitions of indebtedness. Yeah, and so this is, and so, you know, what, what we're really talking about here is at what point does the liability for known pre closing taxes get paid? You know, it used to be, that you know, maybe we'd have in the tax matters section that when the return was filed, that the taxes would be paid by the pre-closing 
tax portion would be paid by the seller at that point. Um, and that would be written into the agreement, or maybe it would be included in, in networking capital. And we've really been seeing buyers want to include this in, in debt um, and make sure that it's taken as an adjustment to the purchase price at closing. You know, I've tried to push back on this, but it really seems to be the market. Um, so have not been as successful as I would like it to be, but there's definitely, you know, ways that I try to carve it back, maybe at least do net of tax refunds um, that are expected or, you know, sort of going through an understanding, is this a pass-through entity? You know, do we actually not expect that many taxes? Maybe it's just employment taxes. So just trying to get an idea of the scope of what we're talking about and what it, you know, what the actual numbers are and what this really means. And is it really just um, a matter of timing? It, you know, this amount getting adjusted for at closing through the purchase price, or is it something that would get paid a couple of months down the road anyway? So Anne, of the, uh, the other day, you mentioned um, that there are some states that are uh, creating an option for pass-through entities to incur entity-level tax to help uh, with the, uh, the phase-out for uh, state tax reductions, the SALT. Um, could, could you expand on what you're, what you're seeing there and, and some of the states maybe that have done this? Yeah, so this is a little bit sort of hot off the presses because, you know, in our our major footprint in terms of um, like North Carolina. North Carolina just put this pass through entity tax in, I think last November, and it's effective for companies um, for tax years beginning January 1st. Um, but the, the idea behind it is, um, you know, we all know that the TCJA put in a limit on the state and local tax deduction that could be taken by individuals and capped that at uh, $10,000. And so what a lot of states have done is they have said, okay, well, we're going to introduce, for pass-through entities, we're going to introduce an entity-level tax. And so instead of now being an individual tax, it's a, um, an entity-level tax. And so arguably is not subject to this uh, deduction cap that's only applicable to individuals. Um, and so there, I mean, there are, it sounds great, and I think a lot of people will will take advantage of it, but there's definitely a lot of things to be worked through on that. Um, we are seeing, you know, for, for folks that are, for buyers that are on top of their game, we are seeing them try to include this as a clawback on, for example, a true up for an asset versus stock deal for an escort. Um, they want you to make the election if it's available for this entity level tax. Um, and and are trying to reduce the amount of their true up. You know, just as a general matter, I think there's a lot of things to be to be worked through. Like, how does it? You know, some of these are mandatory, some of them are elective, some of them work as a deduction to the individual, some of them work as a credit. And then, if you have individuals that have responsibility in multiple states, if you now have you've now moved your tax liability from your individual level to your to an entity level if other if you're getting taxed in other states and they're giving you a credit at the individual level can you still get that for the entity level tax and the answer may be no so you know there's there's a lot to be worked through um, but that's that's out there and we're we're seeing that in um, we're seeing buyers try to take advantage of that on purchase agreements now, I would imagine that that's going to uh, require some changes to entity documents as well. Um, you know, presumably, if the entity becomes taxable, we're going to have to have some uh, uh, indemnification provisions for the individual members. Yeah, absolutely. And sort of, work, you know, this is all very fresh and working through how indemnification would work and um, does it affect. S Corp and their shareholders, if they're non-residents, you know, can you have potential somehow for disproportionate distributions? Like there's there's a lot of threads to be to be pulled on um, on this pass-through entity tax concept. Yeah. So uh, another uh, I guess ongoing trend is is the sort of continuing results from various pandemic relief uh, legislation. So what are you seeing being done? Uh, in terms of due diligence and reps and warranty insurance and, and other things related to 
uh, pandemic relief legislation. Yeah. So, you know, we still have, um, you know, a lot of those provisions, like the, the deferral for employment taxes. So we're seeing folks, you know, focus on, or buyers focus on what the liabilities are that are still outstanding um, for any deferred payments under COVID relief legislation. Um, and sellers will want to know if they still have credits coming in under any relief legislation. Um, so it's just something to keep, you know, it, it's still something that's ongoing that we need to keep track of in the, in the diligence. Um, and as far as the reps and warranties insurance, you know, just because there's reps and warranties insurance doesn't mean that, um, that it will cover all taxes. Like traditionally, uh, the insurance has carved out um, a lot of that they may be doing their own due diligence and carve out um, where you know where they know there are problem issues um, or there's just certain things that sometimes are always carved out like transfer pricing you know some salt provisions um, and so that may go back to like the the workforce mobility issues so um, again just because there's ropes and warranties insurance um, doesn't mean we're off the hook for for tax purposes okay um... So uh, tell me about some of the issues you're seeing around pre-transaction -con uh, pre conversion of an LLC to a C corporation. Yeah, so this isn't, you know, something that we see in the deals themselves, but it's something that maybe is done um, a couple of years beforehand. So, you know, we'll have a lot of startup companies that started up as LLCs, but they're now getting a new round of funding and they want to move to... Um, C corporation status. So one thing to be very aware of, typically we think of LLC to C corporation conversions as a tax-free conversion. Um, and that's usually under, and I'll sort of get tax geeky here, it's under section 351, but there's a big sort of exception under 351 if you have liabilities that are in excess of the basis of your assets. So if you have these startup companies that took on a lot of liabilities um, or have convertible debt or you know, other types of debt instruments, and now in the 351, the, the new corporation is basically deemed to um, acquire the assets and assume the liabilities of the LLC. And so if you have these excess liabilities, they can throw off gain to, um, to the members. And so we really have to go through and make sure that we understand um, what the money was used for, because, for example, was it used to buy assets, in which case then you really should have, you know, basis equal to the amount of the liabilities, um, or was it used for R&D type expenses that maybe threw off losses that flowed through to the members, and if they haven't used those losses yet, and if there is gain, maybe they can offset it, but there are a bunch of, um, we have limitations on NOLs. Um, we also have 461L. So there's, you really have to sort of go through and some things that we thought maybe used to be quite simple are, are no longer as, as, as simple. So it's a, a bit of a, a trap for the, uh, either the unwary or even the, the wary, just to make sure that something um, that should be tax-free really is. So we've got just a, a minute left, Anna, but I want you to uh, bring out your crystal ball and let us know what you think might happen this year with the, the tax legislation associated with Build Back Better. Yeah, I mean, we've got, um, I mean, if I had the crystal ball, I'd probably be charging a lot more for it, but um, <laughs> I wouldn't tell anyone. Um, but yeah, we've got a lot of things on, you know, that, that could be happening this year. We've got tax legislation, um, that you know is still being discussed. We have talks about increases in in interest rates. Um, I'm hearing that you know all those SPACs that everybody set up in the last year or two. You know they only have 18 months or two years to to find their their targets. Um, so some of those are going to be expiring. So I think there are a lot of a lot of factors that we're we're still looking forward to this year. Um, and yeah, in terms of the, the legislation, you know, it seemed like there, there was some agreement on some of the provisions, but, you know, we know that like the, the, the salt cap, um, some credits are, are really being discussed. So we'll, we'll have to wait and see on that one. Okay. Well, that's probably as good as anybody could do with the crystal ball. 
Um, well, thanks, Anna, and thanks, everyone, for attending today. Uh, again, if you have any questions, uh, please reach out to us directly. Our contact info is on the screen. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be sharing the, uh, the slides uh, to the email list of folks who signed up for the, the webinar. Uh, thanks again for attending, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.